Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. Kate, last week, uh, Friday, we're recording this on a Monday. On Friday, I asked you for three bullet points to describe uh, describe me at work. And um, do you remember what those three things that you said about me were? Yeah, so I didn't think you were going to want to talk about it on air, but I said at the time, passionate, scattered, and kind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think those those three things are very endearing, so thank you for those compliments. Um, the three The three bullet points are important because – the topic of today's conversation is about your personal brand and, and becoming, I guess, a better version of yourself, um, not only in the workplace, but just generally speaking, and how we perceive ourselves versus how others perceive us and moving towards what how we want to be perceived by others. Um, and I think the guest that we have with us today is the person who prompted that conversation for us on Friday, but also um, kind of the, the advocate for getting more from yourself and, and really working on your own personal brand. So, Kate, I'll throw it back to you to, to introduce our guest for today. Yeah, absolutely. So, our guest today is Andrea Clark, and I actually discovered her a few weeks back when I was listening to a really cool webinar uh, from Up Money, which is a, a previous podcast guest, and it was all about getting yourself ready for the future of work and not waiting for the world to happen, actually putting yourself in the front seat of your own career and your own life and making sure you're ready and prepared for whatever life throws at you. So I really enjoyed Andrea's talk then and thought she'd be an amazing guest uh, for our listeners today. So I'll throw it over to you, Andrea, just to introduce yourself. And I know you've got a really interesting background. So maybe just like a quick summary of that as well. Oh, thanks, Kate. Well, Owen and Kate, thank you for having me. It's such a delight to be here. I am the author of a book called Future Fit, How to Stay Relevant and Competitive in the Future of Work. And I tell people I am a recovering television news reporter. <laughs> I spent uh, I spent the bulk of my career as a commercial TV news reporter, um, almost 10 years of that career based in Washington, D.C., covering Pentagon State Department White House for Thomson Reuters and Al Jazeera English. And I transitioned into the humanitarian aid arena for a couple of years working in Iraq and working on projects to rebuild Afghanistan, Iraq, Jordan and Georgia, and um, then moved into uh, the Save Darfur organisation. So I had a few career transitions when I was in the States, which was actually the catalyst for me writing the book Future Fit. What I do now is I run a, a digital career development program called Future Fit, and I essentially train about a 1,000 people a year to communicate with authority and get Future Fit for the 2020s. Andrew, um, having listened to a bit of your stuff, um, being familiar with the book and some of the principles, um, there are a few kind of key phrases that I'm hoping you can define for us because I think they set the scene for what we're about to talk to. But one thing just quickly, with you said you educate about a 1,000 people, which is incredible. How, how, how do you go about doing that? Could someone just, could an individual who, let's say, um, whether or not maybe you're career-minded or you're a professional or what have you, could someone come to you and just say, can we have um, a one-on-one -on -one session or is it more like group focused and or in the in the workplace? Yeah, great question. I do a couple of things. So definitely all about the individual and someone can email me and say, can I do a 90-minute session, which is essentially a strategic work plan for the next 12 months and mm -hmm. in addition or as an alternative to that, they can be part of a three-week uh, fully digital program around either communicating with impact or adaptive leadership. And so that's where the bulk of my work has been this year, probably impacting, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people with that three-week program, which is highly interactive, highly demanding, and not like other online programs. I think online gets a bad rap, but I'm working with a team who have spent many, many years developing a highly engaging platform, which my content 
fits really well into. So is that something that I'm just thinking about that from selfishly from my perspective, would that be something that like I would attend out of work hours or is it a three week intensive every day kind of program? Yeah, and you can start on February eight if you like. Uh, that's our okay. next program. <laughs> so it's um, I I suggest three to four hours a week for three weeks, and that is something you can do in your own time. We have we take a blended approach, so we drop in a few live chats through the program. So in those live chats are only thirty minutes, so pretty short and sharp, and mm-hmm. very easy to work into the day. The whole point of being online is to impact more people more often without compromising the learning outcomes. And fascinatingly, what I've seen this year is the capability lift and the learning outcomes are, you know, on average 30% higher than what I would see in a classroom setting, which is really astounding for me because, you know, I've been running 60 workshops a year since probably 2011. And you think it doesn't get better than that when actually it does Mm -hmm. because what happens in a digital environment is that it levels the playing field for introverts. So if you're not inclined to raise your hand in the classroom, you will do it without hesitation online. So there's a much more, much more of a comfortable um, scenario. and we, we keep it a very safe, very psychologically safe environment. But I love it because I see people who are innately um, uh, introverted just get involved and and get far more involved than what they would in a normal setting. So that, to me, as a facilitator, is incredibly rewarding because it's all about growth and it's all about accelerating those human skills that will keep us disproportionately advantaged through the next few years. For sure. It's such an important thing. You know, people that are even listening to this podcast um, will benefit for, from, you know, a, a, not activities, but programs such as that. Um, you know, I th- we talk about compounding on the show a lot because those little things that you do, um, you know, just snowball over time. Uh, before we get sidetracked too much, Andrew, I know there's a lot for us to get to. I'm hoping that you can just give us the, I guess, the the definitions or the, the, the key introductions to some of the, the key principles that we're going to talk about. And some of those things are, you know, the difference between personal brand and reputational capital, um, purpose, being intentional, and the micro moment. So that's a lot to take in in one question, but I'm sure you're more than capable to kind of give us the field guide on that. If you could just go from the top, that would be helpful. <laughs> the difference between personal brand and reputation capital. So um, reputation, personal brand is a term that I use for the traditional workplace, which I think is dead. The traditional workplace is over. You know, personal brand is very 1980s. It, it belongs with shoulder sh- belongs with shoulder pads, is what I like to say. <laughs> and what I love about upgrading the term to reputation capital is that it's so much more relevant to the environment that we're working in, which has been totally fragmented by technology. So reputation capital, this is a term defined by Rachel Botts by the way, who's an Oxford scholar and an absolutely brilliant mind who wrote a book called Who Can You Trust? So reputation capital is a new measure of trust. And that's important because our reputation is leaving a trail in a way that it never used to with personal brand. Personal brand is a one-on-one experience. You show up, you put your CV on the desk and you hope for the best in that job interview. Whereas reputation capital is literally the measurement of how much a community or a marketplace trusts you. It's the absolute sum total of our online and offline behaviour and it's really, it's so much more than what people say about us when we're not in the room. It's about that collective and, as you say, compound interest of what we build up and what we curate about ourselves online. So, um, I think it's um, in terms of purpose, uh, I think quite simply there's no, I'm going to be controversial and say there's no room to be average in the next five years and there's mm. no more dangerous time to be neutral. So reputation capital for me is about um, is about thinking it, it's about thinking of it in really simple terms and I look at it as as a framework and stop me if I'm taking up too much time here. But That's great. The, yeah, so basically there's this once in a generational opportunity here for all of us to take control of our online behaviour and decide what we want to be known for. So how do we get started? It's fairly straightforward. Purpose, position, audience and activity. 
four steps to starting to build strong, incredible reputation capital. So in terms of purpose, this is about what we want to contribute to the marketplace, what we want to give to the world and the conversations that we want to start. In terms of position, what's the platform that we want to be visible on? For many of us, that may only be LinkedIn. For others, that might be something internal. It might be Yammer. It might be workplace internally because we might not feel like we want to be exposed publicly. But LinkedIn for many of us is that platform. When it comes to audience, number three, that's the circles and the communities that we want to engage with. And in terms of activity, this is the broadcast plan. Now, this broadcast plan, as I say, doesn't need to be public because we all know that leadership does not have to be loud. So when it comes to an activity, what do we want to communicate and how often do we want to communicate that? Is that making sense for everyone? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this is essentially about um, behaving, being seen as someone who's behaving on purpose and behaving with intention. So um, we need to give, you know, we need to give order and we need to collect our identity and make sure that our online behaviour is aligned with everything that we deliver in person. It's really, it's that simple, but it's complicated. It takes time to think it through and it takes time, like anything, to implement a strategy, even one as simple as that. But we have to be far more considered about it as we move through the next couple of years. Mm, And I think it's really interesting because even I'm just thinking the last few jobs I've had, I didn't find out about them through sort of Seek or the traditional method. I actually found both of them through Twitter, which is probably not what you'd think you'd find a a job normally. And uh, I just, I think it's so interesting once you're in the workplace, how often the jobs happen from the people that you know rather than the people that you're just going out and trying to find. And once you're actually working in the corporate workplace, you figure out it's actually a lot more about those networks and communities rather than just hiring someone based on their CV. And I I think that was a really interesting thing you talked about, um, about investing in yourself and identifying what's important as well. So one of the things I wanted to ask you was what is our responsibility for finding and securing work now and into the future? It's 1,000% our responsibility. Um, There's no such thing as job security. I'm going to be controversial as I was before and say (laughs) there's just no room to be average at what we do Mm. in the next few years. And I think there are three guiding reasons for this. Number one is the biggest cost of business is people and place and companies are rethinking the way they organise work and talent. We're looking at a far more Uberized model of work. You know, we've got banks, for example, shutting down entire businesses and exiting leases. Mm -hmm. We've got um, stacks of restructures going on, some of them very quietly where full-time jobs are replaced with contract workers. So, this casualization of the workforce is something we're going to see a lot more of. Um, and secondly, um, it's more of our responsibility because as all of these brilliant, full-time, highly skilled knowledge workers exit these corporates, we're going to see stacks of talent step into the mix of the freelance world. They're going to be consultants, they're going to be contractors. And so these great gigs that we want are going to be fiercely competitive. So our reputation capital and our networks have to be a much greater part of our every day and every week because that's what's going to land us the projects that we want to be part of. And I might just say that thirdly, looking ahead, you know, I think it's a good thing to think about work in a different, you know, with a different lens. I don't think there's any reason to have a full-time job. There's no reason to be looking for a full-time job if you don't want one um, because you'll you'll be attached to one business where essentially all of your risk is concentrated. So my advice very broadly is that we shouldn't be looking for a full-time job. We should be spreading our risk and working on several projects. I think, Owen, you're an investor. Is that Mm -hmm. right? Yep, that's right. I I like to look at our professional lives the same way we look at investing in the market, and that is that we don't typically have 100% of our money in one stock. We diversify what we're spending and we spread the risk, and I think that that is a great and exciting and, you know, very optimistic way to look at our own future of work because we're in a much looser and less structured work arena and 
I, I, I personally think the responsibility was always 100% ours, but, you know, we've we've never seen anything like what we're going into. And, you know, the future, the future of work was catalyzed 10 years and 10 weeks earlier this year. And, you know, when I wrote Future Fit, that was in um, April 2019, you know, I was not writing for a pandemic, clearly, but I was writing for major disruption. And, of course, mm-hmm. here we are where your talent is the only thing that matters in the future of work. It's not technology. It's not other types of disruptions. It's your talent and how you decide to organise yourself around that and respond to that. Yeah, and I think it really comes into, as you said, how you can actually convey that talent to other people and your networks and your communities because you might be amazing but if you don't actually find out ways to demonstrate that people want a lot more than that cv so do you have some suggestions on how do you actually um, convey this to a wide audience your talents and your abilities and your portfolio and that sort of thing yeah i think that we can all relate to being humble you know it's you know Mm. no no one wants to be that person who's, you know, the show off at work and no one wants to PR themselves. But what I say to people is, um, you know, you may not care about curating a brand, but I know for sure that you care about your reputation. We are trading in trust. That's what we're doing, mm. networking in this new market. So when it comes to talking about ourselves, I really feel like we've, we've got to be, we've got to be clear on, we've got to be clear on two things. And the first one is, you know, why do we and how do we actually stand out? And then how do we communicate that value? So I want everyone to think about a couple of words to describe you. And this is really simple, but it really makes you think. And it also gives you the opportunity to do an audit, do a mini micro brand audit with five people that you really trust that are, that won't that won't filter what they think. So you yeah, know it's really important because and I love that you mentioned, was it Scattered before, Kate, about Owen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we um, yeah, we were actually having a chat with the, the team on Friday about three characteristics we'd describe ourselves based on your chat. And um, I think often, I mean, our team, I feel, is pretty honest behind the scenes, but um, I think a lot of people, if you'd ask that, they'd just give you a nice version. Mm. <laughs> They would, of course, and and you know what we want to do is make sure that the way we perceive ourselves and the way we're being perceived in the workplace is aligned. Because if there's a misalignment there, then we have to do something to bring it closer together. This is about being closely connected to the value that we bring, and that starts with thinking about why do I stand out? Why do people come to me? And then how do I prove that? So. I, I like to say to people, like, put it into this context. Imagine I'm walking past your desk and I'm, you know, in our imaginary workplace. Um, <laughs> imagine I'm walking past your desk or I or I say, hey, Owen, I'm getting on a call in five minutes with the big boss. I want to advocate for you in this new role coming out. What do you want me to say about you? And that's all it comes down to. What do we want said about us when we are not in the room to sponsor or advocate for ourselves for a new gig. So what does that sound like? What do you think it sounds like now? What would you like it to sound like? So that's the first very simple idea and concept that I want everyone to think about. And um, secondly, it's how do we communicate that value? So this is about communication is, I think, the most underrated piece of leadership. You know, we are all leaders whether we know it or not. And when people look to us to lead, they're looking for direction, protection and order, particularly in a chaotic environment. And part of that is one of the guiding principles of adaptive leadership, and that is communication. This is a core competency of leadership, and it's absolutely critical to how we exercise authority in our roles. And so part of that is communicating our value. And that can be as simple as, you know, jumping on a conference call with new colleagues, how are you going to introduce yourself in a way that has impact and that makes a connection because it's all about connecting. So I do not say to people, I'm the, manage, I'm the managing director of Future Fit Co because it doesn't mean anything. What I say is that it's my job to train a 1,000 people a year to be Future Fit for the 2020s. So I want everyone to think about how would you – describe yourself without using your business card because often there's a total disconnect to what's on our business card compared to the value that we create and deliver. 
So I know that sounds like comms 101, but, you know, I, I can't believe how many people we need to be facilitated through this because when it's about mm-hmm. us, you know, we're, we're naturally very humble, but it's very important how you, you know, how you make that first connection, especially now that we're virtual. It, it matters how you talk about yourself and that's how, you know, when you're talking about yourself in simple, candid, conversational terms but in a way that has impact, other people are going to carry that paper into the room when you're not there. And I'll give you an example. There's This is probably one of my favourite examples. I was working with this extremely smart young lady um, at a major bank and it was her job. Um, she had this very important job and I said, tell me what your title says on your business card. And she said, oh, I'm the business development strategic. And I was like, stop, I can't take it. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't understand what you were saying and I'm not connecting with that at all. As it turned mm-hmm. out, we we kind of redefined that into it's her job to run the team that processes a billion dollars worth of home loans for the bank. Now, mm-hmm. I, what I love about that is that it gives your audience this immediate sense of the scope of your work and the scale of your work and your capacity to deliver. So you can see how that does make a difference when you are when you're meeting with a couple of hundred people a year, that makes a difference with the impact that you want to make in that group. So you walk into the room and even with that line, people know you can create value. Mm. Uh, Andrea, I've heard some of these stories and they're fantastic. I think one thing that people, maybe just to hit the nail on the head here, what people need to understand is we're not necessarily talking about like technical skills that here are. We're talking more about those those softer skills that come with, you know, being, I guess, the best version of yourself and letting the world know that you are that person. Um, Kate and I often talk about upskilling and, and making sure that you have those technical skills. Do you think it's acceptable now going forward to just have the technical skills? I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's probably let's close in the question. I'm guessing the answer is going to be no. Is it just enough to have technical skills? Um, no, it's not, unfortunately, no. And what we're seeing increasingly in the job application process is people are applying with a one-minute video. You might mm. have core skills, but you're going to be struck out on that candidate list because you perhaps can't express a clear idea with warmth and, warmth and sincerity and natural authority. So that's just the communication side of it. Uh, I wrote Future Fit because I believe there are eight human skills or power skills or soft skills. There are eight human skills at a minimum that we all need to invest in because they're all, they're all going to look different in a different environment. So communication is certainly, you know, I said in Future Fit that we need to be super communicators by 2025. Well, in fact, it's 2020. So here we are. <laughs> You know, we we need to have impact in those short, sharp moments that we have with people. And that's just one example of, you know, the human skills that are making a huge difference to whether or not you're fit and able and you can move, you can use your network to move into roles that inspire you and where you can really deliver. So um, it's great to have the technical skills, but it's not enough. And I don't think it has been enough for some years, but we're seeing an acceleration of of the skills that that go beyond that that um, help us navigate all of those all of the, the those sort of places in between. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. I'm increasingly seeing research around, you know, the top three things that HR managers and talent managers are seeing missing in the workplace, and communication and problem solving and critical thinking is always up there in the top three, and it's incredible how how those even just problem solving and your, and your ability to communicate, that packs a real punch in the workplace. And um, as I said, leadership doesn't have to be loud, but we need to be clear and compelling. And, you know, clear communication, for example, is an extension of clear thinking. And, you know, so that sort of, it's this cycle that rolls back around to being a strong leader. So soft skills are where it's at. <laughs> that's, my, that's my view. <laughs> One In one of the interviews you did recently, you talked about, um, and you mentioned this at the top of the show, about brand being one-dimensional. Can you just kind of, I guess, remark on what that means and, and why it's important to understand what it is and isn't? Yeah, so personal brand is one-dimensional, reputation capital is three-dimensional, and I use that term to really just um, get it, give everyone a sense of 
the gravity that is that is that surrounds reputation capital because we have social media profiles we have we have we have an online presence and reputation capital i call it three dimensional because it's just so much more important than than that one dimensional one person view so instead of instead of literally being in front of one person who you're expressing your personal brand to technology is is completely shifted the influence that we're able to have so three dimensional is simply you know it, it's been um you know covid's particularly taken a, a baseball bat to to personal brand because we're now online all the time our visibility is you know when we control our privacy settings we're still visible to um to you know a million different parts of the world so it has a it has a real weight and a, i think a real responsibility to how we manage that and take control of it instead of just letting it have a life of its own i don't think there could be anything worse than than having a, a public profile that you don't manage and update and keep current and it's something really simple but for example linkedin your profile photo on linkedin if you if that photo is looks 10 years out of date and a, a talent managers probably going to ask themselves <laughs> well does that mean that their skill set is 10 years out of date this is about currency this is about mm. this is about continuous work and continuous improvement and you know in, in many ways the next few years in the future of work however you want to define that is is going to be more work for us but i do think it's going to be extremely self-fulfilling and give us more freedom mm. Mm. and it's and the employer that wants to hire you wants to know who you are and your personality and what you stand for they don't want to just see a, a linkedin page that has a has no photo and looks like it hasn't been updated in years and i think it's kind of that same concept i was talking to owen the other week when I want to see if a small business is still operating, if a cafe is still going. I'll go to their Instagram or their Facebook page to see if they've posted recently. And if not, I think hmm, maybe it's a bit dodgy or maybe it hasn't been, maybe it's closed down. And I think that's that same sort of logic applies to humans as well. Absolutely. We're a community of co-creators now. We want to feel connected to the people who are in our community, whether that's in the workplace or that cafe. So I agree with you. And when you feel like someone isn't there or they're not present, then there's a disconnect and you might end up going to another cafe. We might end up hiring mm -hmm. someone else because you want to feel like you're in a community where where there's a degree of co-creation going on. That's a new, it's sort of like the new brand orbit that we're moving in. It's not, it's non-linear. You know, those, mm. those many days are over and and I think that should be a relief for everyone because it's such a magnificent thing to connect with people and, you know, um, have conversations, move, move your ideas forward. You know, you can only do that when you're connecting with people. Yeah, absolutely. Now, right now there's a lot of uncertainty about, I mean, the coming year and the next decades mm. ahead. So, as a young person, it is slightly scary and I'm sure it's just as scary for everyone else, but I can only talk from my perspective. So what does the future of work look like and how can we get really comfortable with uh, the the change and uncertainty ahead? Well, don't be scared. <laughs> I, know that, I know there is a lot of uncertainty out there, but I think that this is an opportunity to really redefine how we want to add value to the world and who we want to do that with and the audiences mm. that we want to talk to. I think the most straightforward answer to that, though, is only becoming clearer now at the end of 2020, and that is that the future of work will be a hybrid work model where we'll find ourselves working from home, working from the office, and perhaps even working from a satellite co-working space that our business might have arranged. And the breakdown of that model looks different depending on which sector we're in and what our business feels is the right way forward because there are many employees, about 39% of employees, who don't feel safe enough to return to the workplace yet. So effectively for us, I think that means three things. Number one, work is going to feel significantly looser and less structured. Number two, the only job security we have is the security that we create for ourselves through upskilling and continuous learning. And thirdly, we need to think more about creating instead of consuming. So creating value instead of being a consumer of everything that's available to us. I think the power shift 
is moving to the individual in a way that we've never seen before. But again, I think that that raises exceptional opportunities for us to um, think about, you know, how the environment, how the economy, how is that impacting the product or the service that I'm personally working on? And then how does that free me up to bring greater value to the business that I'm working for? Um, I think that, you know, on a very personal level, um, the next few years is going to ask us to to be more anchored um, clearly in our values because when we're clear on that, we've got a lot more control over our lives and I think that we're going to be able to absorb changes in the market more easily. There's a really interesting piece of research out that says that the stronger our identity um, you know, if we've got a strong work identity, we're three and a half times more likely to be productive, but also be resilient to the changes that are happening in the market. So I think, you know, going back to reputation capital, there's never been a more critical time to reflect on that and work on that because that identity is going to see you through any further volatility and uncertainty that we're going to face. Um, and it's going to be the foundation of, of, of how you work. Um, on the issue of how we get comfortable with that, I think that this is there's only one way and that is by embracing those principles around an adaptive mindset. We I just mm-hmm. don't we can we can't adapt to change if we don't see it coming. So um, you know we've seen increasing references to terms like you know EQ and IQ, but now we're shifting to the adaptability quotient, the AQ. Mm-hmm. And there are three. This is great for everyone listening. There, if you want to really know how to um, accelerate an adapt an adaptable mindset, these are those. These are three sort of perspectives that I think we can draw on: um, engage, activate, and release. And when I say engage, I mean this is simply about having a curious mindset to your industry, and this is being alert to the signals of change. Um, activate is about activating our energy around having optimism for change. This is about seeing change as a great thing, which it always is, but we don't necessarily think about that in the moment. And thirdly, release is about letting go of anything that's holding you back. I might just give you an example of what I mean by this um, because it happened to me and this was part of the catalyst for me writing this book. Um, in about 2008, I was walking I was a journalist. I was walking to the Al Jazeera Bureau on K Street in Washington, D.C., and for the first time in years, I did not buy a copy of the New York Times. I looked at the New York Times on my mobile and about it took me about 100 metres to figure it out because it was only 100 metres between that newsstand and the Bureau. I got up to the Bureau and I decided to leave journalism because I could see that the the business model of news was failing really fast and that I was already working 12-hour shifts for like less than $300 a day and I knew that I couldn't physically sustain that if it was going to get harder. And so I made the decision then to step out of television journalism and step into, um, you know, the human rights arena, which is essentially still storytelling. So that, that common thread for me has been consistent through my career. Um, mm. But there was, but when I mentioned to my friends, look, I'm going to make a transition, I'm going to move into international aid work, they said, you know, you're crazy, we're in television, you know, nothing is, um, we're, we're kind of bulletproof. And I remember thinking, mm. what an interesting comment from colleagues whose job it is to cover unforeseen circumstances <laughs> every day. Like, you know, covering Hurricane Katrina. I still remember that day in the newsroom where we were like, oh, the storm has passed, it's all fine, and then two hours later, total catastrophe. So Mm. this was about forecasting and it felt like standing on the shoreline, seeing this hurricane come towards us, and I'd be saying to people, hey, should we get out of here? Should we do something different? And many people were like, no, this is, Mm. you know, we're, you know, we're going to be here forever. And as it turns out, they weren't. And so I think that when it comes to adapting to change, as I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, with that engaging and having a curious mindset and being alert to the signals of change, do not kid yourself. Like if you can see little pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and it's all starting to stack up, you need to pay attention to the marketplace and you need to have the courage to make a decision that's going to set you up for longevity. Mm-hmm. I, I often come across people who 
um, are, you know, that are resistant to change. I think that's kind of everywhere. Um, mm-hmm. I think if something fulfills a, a need, so if something solves a problem in a way that hasn't been done before, like a better way, I think you don't want to stand in front of that change. And those people that resist it generally are the ones that um, end up getting hurt by that change. You know, we see that all the time when we talk about, you know, cashiers and, and automated checkouts and all different types of stuff. Um, one of the things that I guess people accept now that they're going to work in a, a fractured w- a re- relationship with their employer's um, office, so to speak. So they would be at the office some days, maybe at home the other days, and maybe in a co-working space, as you suggested. What are some of the practical s- steps that people can take or the tricks that we can use on ourselves to maintain our purpose and to ensure that we're still working efficiently towards the goals that we want to work towards? Well, that's a pretty um, very important question. Um, uh, I think that regardless of where we are, it's really important to stick to a routine. I think that we've all been through this discovery phase through all of 2020 that's helped us redefine how are we most productive and how are we the highest performing? And I think for many of us, you know, 36% of women want to stay home because they're getting more done and they're more productive. It's It's you know, it's the men and the older employees that want to return to the office. In fact, 47% of men want to go back compared to 36% of women. And I think which is really interesting, isn't it? Um, Yeah. Um, But I think for all of us, I think, I think many of us is, and many of us have ended up being high performing through this year because we figured out, we can, Mm -hmm. you know, we can work out for an hour, you know, we can still get up early in the morning, um, knock off a few phone calls, but go and do a workout and eat cleaner, have more control over, you know, how we spend our time, have many less distractions. And I think that we've all navigated our way through that in a very individual way. And that's what's so interesting for me about the future of work, that it's so highly contextual and highly personal because we all have different things. We're all living different lives. We're all in different households. Mm. But I think that regardless of where we are, sticking to the routine and being diligent about that is is the key to um, mm. being high performing. So st- you know, keep working out, keep eating clean, but and clock off. Like we're working forty five minutes longer every single day, according to Alassian. So you know, when it's time to clock off, get up and leave the computer. Go outside. Mm. You know, continue. Get on with the day. Um, you know, the, the research is saying that we're working harder, but but we're happier. So it's going to be interesting to see how we all manage that through next year. And and I think that businesses have got a real struggle on their hands figuring out how do we actually, you know, how do we organise the workplace in a way that works for everyone when we've got 3,000 different competing priorities, you know. Um, Andrew, there is a story that, and this is kind of an unrelated topic, so I'm just going to go straight into this one, but there is a story that you, you spoke about uh, in a previous interview we talked about someone who you, you got an email from someone and they said, we've just lost this mission critical person and then maybe I'll let you fill in the blanks of what happened next. I feel like this is a really powerful story of kind of, it, it illustrates a lot of what you're talking about here and also in the book. Yeah, and thank you for bringing that up because for me this is one a case study of, of um, a case study that I use when I'm running workshops and that is when we were figuring out you know, when we were talking about the fact that um, networking is, you know, our networks are more important than ever and, you know, building and creating uh, meaningful networks and tapping our dormant ties is going to be so critical. And I use that story as an example. So I one day I'm sitting at my computer, I get an email from one of my favourite people who's in media and she has emailed a group of like three or four people on this email thread and it said... I, it was literally two paragraphs. I just had a resignation from a mission critical person. I need a super smart business development manager who can negotiate. Do you know anyone? I'm paying 300k. And I thought, well, 300k. I reckon mm. I could do a great job. <laughs> <in a business. laughs> yeah. um, but I and I thought that is exactly and precisely how things are going to play out in the next few years. Um, you know, mm. we have to, we're in this micro community where where a few people are going to accelerate the opportunities we have. And I went back to her within three minutes because I had the right person for her. I said, I went back and I said, I have your person, three bullet points. She's the most commercially savvy female in the market. 
Number two, I know that she generated $32 million for the business that she was working for last year. And thirdly, she also just happens to be in her spare time a national uh, Australian Telstra Businesswoman of the Year. Like this is the person for you. Yeah. So that's me effectively advocating for someone when she's not in the room and she got the job and she's uh, exceptional. And so that for me was such a great, you know, moment where, we had real proof of how things are going to keep working and keep flowing. You know, you you can upload your CV to LinkedIn with 350 other people, but your time is much better spent having conversations and, um, and connecting with the ties that you already have. The, the, you know, the gold in your, the, you know, the gold in your network is right in front of you. You just have to, You've got to talk to people. You've got to call them. You've got to give them something, give people something, offer up. Always be as helpful as you can and you know that that will be, um, you know, that will be reciprocated when you need it. But you spent business is all about relationships and relationships Relationships are about the long game. So we've, we've all got to play the long game in a very meaningful, organic and and purposeful way. Like no one wants to be used. Networking is not about transactions none of us like to be used we all know how that feels when someone's used us to get a go it's awful and we should be we should be on the other end of that spectrum having real conversations really understanding where people are at and what they need and what they're working on and Mm. seeing we can be helpful in in that regard Mm. i've heard of i've heard Mm. of employers um certain employers very high performing environments they will only hire people if the person has a connection to someone at the company and they can vouch for them. Um, and I think that's like a, a, maybe it's a bit of a hard um, filter to get people into the business, but it's one that kind of uh, tacks onto this, I guess, idea of reputational capital. Absolutely. There's an example of trusted, you know, being in the trusted network and um, recruiting from a qualified, a qualified talent pool. That talent pool is, is going to be is really going to rapidly expand. I mean, we've seen fifty five thousand additional sole traders between February and April this year. So what's happening is people are exiting major businesses and they're starting their own their own companies and they're identifying as managing director. So that's up thirty nine percent on last year, which is pretty remarkable. So the challenge for all of us who step out of a business is how do we stay connected in a, in a meaningful way with everyone so we can be on that short list for that great gig or that great job that's coming up. Mm. And if we want to think a bit more intentionally about the direction of our career, especially if you're in your 20s and 30s right now, would you have a look at things like the the Australian government's future job outlook report? Um, I was having a look in my research to have a look at some of the rapidly expanding and shrinking roles and industries in Australia. And do you think that's a relevant thing to sort of take into account when you're thinking about career planning? You know, I don't. I don't because I understand that there are some industries that are accelerating over others, but you can't just be a doctor because your parents want you to be a doctor and you can't, you know, you can't be a lawyer just because lawyers are always going to be, you know, um, needed because they may not be. We don't know. Um, I think I would encourage everyone listening to um, to not necessarily thinking about attaching ourselves to an industry or a, biz- a business or a job. I think that we should all attach ourselves to a mission and a calling and a purpose because you'll always be at peace if you have that. And this is one important thing about building reputation capital that I want to add. Um, You know, I know some extraordinary people who have spent 15 years at a bank, for example. They leave the bank or they get restructured out of their role and no one outside the bank knows who they are. I think it's really important for all of us to consider how do we, how do we build an identity that runs parallel with the job that we have? So when it comes to that moment where things don't go our way, we've got this, we've got this well, you know, we've got this network that we can rely on, that we can say, hey, um, you know, I'm, I've left the bank or wherever and I'm looking for a role and you bet the next role they get is through their connection. So we should all be conscious about, you know, b- building building a profile that runs parallel and that still allows us to have a presence and have visibility that goes well beyond the business. Does that make sense? I think it's really important. 
because we spend Absolutely. Mm. and we spend so much time playing the inside game, and that's great. It's great to play the inside game and be known internally and and do everything you can to progress your team and your campaign within a business. But what about outside the business? I'd like to see more people stepping onto Q&A panels to bring that talent to a broader community. And I'd like to see people building their profile that goes well beyond the business and it goes across the industry. If someone, just as we come to the back of this, Andrea, if someone was to walk away from this discussion and um, you were to leave them with one thing, if, if I could be so uh, rude to ask you to, to name one thing that they should take away from this conversation um, before they go and you know check out the book and um, your workshops and everything that's available online. What's the one thing that you would really impress upon people? To invest in yourself often and as often as you can because we can't give anything if we're not growing. And we're all knowledge workers now. I'm sure the majority of the people listening to the podcast are knowledge workers. So if we're not growing, we can't give anything. We can't create Mm. value. So my advice is to listen to the World Economic Forum data around dedicating 25 days a year to continuous learning because that's what's going to move you forward. Your business can't. Look, I've constantly been investing in in myself at great expense to my superannuation because I know that if I'm moving forward, You know, I couldn't have written Future Fit unless I took myself to, you know, an exponential innovation program in Silicon Valley. You know, that was a very expensive exercise. So when you don't have budget from the business, you've got to find it yourself. You've got to be relentless and curious Mm. about growing your brain and, and being able to translate that into how you give to the business and the industry that you're working in. Mm. Mm, And I think it's really important for people not just to put money aside in their budget for travel and all those other expenses, but actually put money aside for investing in their selves and their future and their career. And that's that's just as important as every other thing we invest in. And I know there's a lot of resources for free and we always share a lot of the, the free resources, but sometimes actually paying money for a course or a program or a degree or a mentor or some sort of training system can actually sort of really be beneficial to your growth as well. Learning comes in so many different formats and even podcasts Mm. like this, that's micro learning. So as long as you're reading, listening to podcasts, you know, there's a really good point to make here and that is that the fastest growing segment of the population, the workforce in the US prior to COVID was that high end gigster. And they, as it turns out, when it comes to continuous learning, were the segment of the workforce who were investing the most in their own learning. So in the previous six months, they didn't, 30% of them, um, sorry, 55% of them had invested in upskilling, whereas only 30% of people who had full-time jobs were investing in themselves. So that says to me, we all have something to learn from, you know, those high-performing, um, fastest-growing parts of the workforce. They are so dedicated to continuous learning, it's it's part of their DNA because they know that they can't mm. grow their client base and they can't grow a business unless they've got something to give. Mm. Andrea, there's so much that we've spoken about here and um, you've told us that normally you would cover just one of these things in an eight-hour workshop. So um, there's, a, there, as Kate said, there are a lot of resources here. Um, if people want to purchase the book, they can head to majorstreet.com.au. They can find the book there. Um, We'll put all the links in the show notes. Andrea, on behalf of Cad and I, thanks for taking the time out to join us on the show. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me and thank you to everyone who's listening. Thanks, Andrea.